everyone. This is Bria, and I am coming to you live for Yachting International Radio. Today, I am pleased to be able to interview Ivan. How are you today? Hi there. How are you doing? Good. And Ivan is a co-founder of Wine Industry. Um, you actually co uh, you actually co-own with your wife. Yes, uh, Lara. She's uh, she's the better half. <laughs> Good man. She's going to see this later. <laughs> That's Smart. Right <laughs> That's how marriages last and business partners last, right? <laughs> so, Ivan, tell me a little bit about yourself, actually. That's where I want to start. Um, where are you from originally? I'm uh, originally from Tenerife in the Canary Islands, uh, where I grew up uh, until the age of about 21. Mm -hmm. And then um, what did you do after that? Like, where was, what was your sort of goal in life? Where as far as career aspirations go? Oh God, um, it was definitely nothing to do with wine at the beginning. Uh, it had to do with, uh, with uh, hospitality. Um, I started sort of uh, very low, just as a, as a waiter in hotels and restaurants on the street or anywhere. And then little by little, we we're progressing and, and going up sort of the, the, the chain, you know, it was from assistant waiter to waiter to then uh, supervisor to then further on you know um so yeah i started up very young when i was 17. uh so even my first contract uh legally my dad had to sign for it but uh it didn't <laughs> and then i went on from there um when until the age of to, uh, about 21 i was in tenerife to, normally in the south of the island where there's a lot more uh, uh, more hospitality uh, and then at the age of 21 I decided to go to the UK over there uh, I kept growing I kept going uh, getting more responsibility getting more uh, uh, I don't know better at the job I suppose or uh, you know growing as a as a restaurant related person I would say because I did all the all the stages uh, assistant manager the manager rest, you know anything and that's where probably in England is where the little spark of wine started I, um, I was working for Hilton Hotels and they um, they used to train us regularly on on the wine menu so that's uh, you know my first sort of proper sit down uh, and have a bit a bit of sit down and taste wine, sit down and know about wines, where they're coming from and this and that. So what brought you then to Mallorca? There's a, step, there's a step in between, which is really important. I went from the UK to Ibiza and I did a few seasons there, always uh, restaurants and, and bars. And then I went to Switzerland and in Switzerland, uh, in a ski resort is where I really started developing my 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 interest for wine to buy wines for myself to uh, to start knowing uh, more and more. Uh, I was in a place uh, called Verbia, uh, really renowned uh, ski resort, and uh, we were very close to the French and the Italian border, as well as having local wines from from the Valais region in there. Uh, so there was quite a broad variety of things that I could uh, I could uh, I could get. So I uh, started really developing uh, the knowledge in there. So uh, yeah, so after ten winter seasons in there, when the snow was sometimes up to my my waist and, <laughs> and having to shovel snow every day, I'm supposed you know about that coming from where you come from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> yeah, I did get a bit tired, and I really thought about we need some sunshine, you know. So uh, yeah, with uh, me and Lara, decided to uh, to have a change. Uh, she, I, I didn't, I did ten years, but she did even longer, and I think we needed a bit of a change. So uh, Mallorca came up, uh, fitted the the profile of what we were looking for, which was. Trying to have a more steady sort of season or trying to get rid of that sort of very short seasonality. In a winter resort, you get everything happens in four months and everyone's got to do 
you know, as much as possible in those four months to get you going for the rest of the year. Well, here in, we started thinking about Spain, south of France, maybe Italy, because uh, the season seems to be a bit uh, more spread out, you know. And when we started to look into a little bit more detail, it seemed like Mallorca or the Balearics had sort of the longer period. You start in Easter time and then you end, if the weather is okay, not this year, but some other years, yeah. uh, you know, you can stretch up to November, you know, the end of November. Or even till Christmas as well. Yeah, I've, I've had some friends uh, going for a swim on Christmas Day here in Mallorca. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a longer season. So that's what we were originally looking for. And you actually, when you got here, was it right away you opened up a restaurant? Yes. Uh, the first idea was uh, to have a, a wine bar or a wine shop. Um, we've been to traveling through, uh, through Switzerland. We did a, a very beautiful trip on a car all the way around Switzerland on the outside. So we did France, uh, Germany. Uh, Czech Republic, uh, we went, came back into uh, Austria, Italy, and then went back into Switzerland. Uh, that was beautiful. And we discovered there that was just this little tiny wine bars where they sell you a bottle if you want, where you can have a few bites of, you know, nice local products to eat and, and drink. And it, it, was, uh, it was the first sort of thing, oh, we could do something like this. Um, and then the idea sort of developed. We had where we lived in Switzerland. We had a few bar, wine bars, um, where um, where we thought, you know, it's always good. We come here, we try a wine, but we never stay here to eat because there isn't enough of an offer, you know. So we thought we maybe in Spain we can do something a bit more like this, but improving the food side of things. You know? So just having a better menu, having a better uh, an opportunity to stay a bit longer and to maybe have that second bottle of wine if you're in a group or or that few more glasses you know yeah and so how did that I mean I I, I had been to the wine industry if, quite a few years back actually when you first opened yeah. um, and it was an absolutely amazing setup but it, it was beautiful um, there was a lot of wood inside and and it just it really felt it didn't it didn't feel Mallorquin it didn't feel like it belonged to Mallorca it actually felt like it belonged well, in Switzerland or Canada, for, <laughs> for that matter. Um, but it was a beautiful setup. But you folks decided to sell that. Now, why is that? Was the restaurant industry not exactly what you were uh, thinking it would be? Or was it just that you had other loves or you wanted to pursue different interests? It was a bit of a mix of things. We, we started a restaurant uh, or a wine bar thinking maybe more of a shop uh slash wine bar but then the business took us in a different direction you know it was uh, people were demanding a bit more food people were demanding uh you know they weren't buying so much wine off the shelf so we had to offer a lot more things by the glass and and, and a lot more uh, complicated dishes so that took up a lot of our time that we didn't anticipate it and uh, but once you're in it you're on in, in Spain, we say, when you're on the horse, you just go, you know, you just carry on. So we kept going and going and going until we sort of, after four or five years, when we decided to, to look back, you know, step back, look at it and say, is this uh, what we originally wanted? Is this making us happy? Is this, uh, you know, making a profit? At the end, a business is about this too, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it kept us afloat. It kept us going for all that long. But it was uh, little by little taking up all of our time and all of our um, efforts, and we couldn't we couldn't develop in other fields that we wanted to. So uh, in the end, we decided that it was a good go. Uh, the restaurant was going well. Uh, it wasn't because you know we had a fall on sales or or anything, but we just uh, took a personal decision really, to say this is not what we want. Let's try and develop. What we uh, what we really want, and that was now it's it's your provisioning. You're doing. Are you doing wine classes as well? You're teaching. You're doing wine tasting, teaching about mm -hmm. wine. I mean, th there's quite a varied sort of range of things that you do with wine industry now. Yeah, it's it's very good because we don't have now. We have a bit more freedom than when you have a a, a bar or a restaurant. We can move around. 
and we can um, we can adapt to to the situation. The, our three main pillars now are uh, distribution, which uh, we supply wines to private clients, to restaurants and bars, to uh, yachts, um, anywhere they want, you know, anyone in the island. Uh, our second pillar will be the uh, wine tasting experiences, which is uh, anything from a range from, uh, you know, trying Mallorcan wines and uh, or uh, do a wine tasting of uh, sparkling wines or natural wines or, uh, you know, uh, um, a wine pairing with uh, wine and chocolate, sort of certain experiences we do, as well as uh, we have a, a, a I say, a, a, an introduction to wine tasting or like a wine course as well. All of these uh, focus on doing in people's places, let's say someone's villa, someone's boat, uh, in the, or in another restaurant if they need to, you know. Wow, so it's, it's oh, quite I'm interesting. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> And the third pillar is the, right. the, vi- the vineyard visits as well. We are starting to, uh, to have a good relationship with some of the vineyards around here. And sometimes uh, we, we're sort of acting uh, as a connection from the client to them. Sometimes most clients come up to us and say, oh, where can we go to visit a vineyard? Which vineyard can we go? Because some of the vineyards here in Mallorca, they're very busy, they're very small, they don't have enough people to, uh, to attend walk-ins, you know. So they're, uh, you know, we're sort of trying to, uh, trying to be a bit of a point in between where I can say, okay, well, if you like this wine or if you like these things, go here, go there. And uh, if you need a few tapas, uh, we're, you know, trying to organize a few of the visits as well, which is it's a nice thing as well. See, and that's, for me, that's interesting because um, I have done wine tours, for example, in Canada, and I think they're a lot more advanced there than they are here as well in Napa Valley, Valley in, in California um, for the simple fact that a winery is actually a business unto itself when it comes to wine tourism. I mean, you have some Michelin star restaurants in these wineries. Um, not only do you get to go through, uh, it, it's set up like a showcase essentially. I mean, the gardens are made for people to walk through. It's not just about the wine tasting experience. These are, these are literally businesses secondary to, yeah. you know, it, it all is based around the wine, of course, because the, the restaurants, they're pairing the wine with the food. Um, but, but it's essentially a business on its own. Why do you think that, I'm not sure if it's all of Spain, but I definitely know that here in Mallorca, um, they're not sort of advanced in that way. Why do you think that is? I think it's mainly because of the size of the of the vineyards. Uh, in here, majority of people move around. Majority of vineyards move around the thirty to one hundred thousand bottles a year, and this is a small scale winery. We're talking about, I don't know. We're talking about. I would say the sixty seventy percent of the wineries here. This is top of my head would move around that sort of numbers. And that mm, requires some people in key moments, but it doesn't require a lot, of, uh, a lot of people throughout the year. So they don't have the, the economical power to, uh, to exploit this thing. I think they have you know, X amount of people, let's say two, three people all year round to look after uh, the vineyard and the vines and the, and, the, and the wines itself and the sales. Therefore, they're too busy to look after, uh, you know, walk-ins and, and people trying to come and visit. Uh, I think it's due to that, really. The bigger wineries have someone dedicated for that, and they, they make enough money, and they have uh, enough to pay an extra salary to receive uh, tourists. So there are, there are some that are trying to do it. Um, but then, yeah, the smaller ones that I think are more, more characterful are a bit more stretched in that sense. Yeah, because I did, I did actually do a wine tour here. Um, oh, it must have been a few years back, um, and it was out of Santa Maria. They had that little train. It's not a train; it goes on the boat on on the road. But uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it, old fashioned wooden. It was really quaint. But what really I think let it down, aside from one near Santa Maria, I think um, Angel 
um, wineries. Um, they are quite big. He he spent a lot of time in the United States, so he has sort of set his winery up in regards to the concept of, of what you would see in Napa Valley or, Valley or, or as well in, in Canada. Um, but some of the other vineyards that we went to, um, you know, they, they put a big table out uh, in the middle of a field, which was great, um, but they just had, you know, a few wines. There was no, there was no real sort of effort put into it, I think. And I, I think a lot of us were disappointed. I, I think if you put the effort in, that people are more prone to purchase your wine with just just that little tiny bit more of effort placed. Of course, uh, people when when you go on a, on one of those tours, uh, and I talk about personal experience as well. One sort of clicks and connects with some vineyards or some people in the vineyard, and 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 you're just done with some others, you know. And I think that sort of personal touch, even though if it's too basic, if you add a bit of personal touch. I think that will go a long way, you know. So um, it, it's that it's it's the difficult thing of trying to get that thing across, you know, that little personal uh, introduction or however you know, however you want to focus it. But it's that little bit extra that will, people will pick up, and then probably it's not the best wine. But if the person there is seems genuine and it seems really uh, really open and 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 welcoming you're probably more likely to to buy their wine really exactly that's how i felt for sure i mean it, you know sometimes you buy a bottle just because you know it's not necessarily because you love the wine um you know but to be honest i'm pretty sure that there's not a person on the face of the earth that is a wine drinker that hasn't drank wine that they're not particularly in love with but because yeah. it's wine <laughs> <laughs> there are times you come home at the end of the day and you don't have anything else other than that one bottle that's been stuck in the very back of your cupboard and you're like, I don't care. I'm drinking that tonight. <laughs> Sometimes it's, neat, it's, a, it's a necessity. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, can you tell me, I've noticed actually driving throughout the island more and more and generally through the center of the island, um, but every year there's more and more fields that are being turned over to growing vines. Um, is the wine industry within Majorca growing? Yes, uh, there is a bit of a boom in terms of, uh, of uh, wineries. We are reaching the 100 very soon, 100 different wineries in the island. Wow. Uh, yeah. So That's a lot for such a small island. It is indeed, yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people that have uh, a lot of Europeans, Northern Europeans, that have a bit of money. They've, they've got this romantic idea of making wine and having a winery. And just, you know, yeah. It is happening. And it's, uh, I don't know if we're having a bit of a overproduction of wines. I think I'm starting to feel that some of the wines are not being uh, sold out when previous years, every wine that was re reasonably good was sold out. Uh, the same year that came into the market and uh, it seems like the last couple of years has been a bit of an abundance of, of wines. Um, producers are looking to export but because the, the local um, consumption has gone, it's gone a bit down or it's a stable really. So if the production is stable and we're getting more vineyards, obviously the market is going to get a little bit overflowing really. Well, how is that possible then? Because isn't there a necessity to have some sort of education when it comes to making wine? I mean, in order to make some of the best wines in the world, these these winemakers um, that, that you hear and read about, the ones that make the award-winning wines, um, generally they've been in the industry for years, they've had all sorts of education. I mean, um, it, it's, it's quite a sought after, you know, if you can find someone whose profession this is, they are very sought after. So yeah. are we finding here in Mallorca that they do have those professionals to make their wine or are they trying to do it on their own? Well, that's a bit of everything, but uh, normally the person who invests in a winery will employ somebody. Obviously, the more renowned, the better. Um, but uh, there are some other little wineries as well that are, uh, Mallorquins especially and then they're, they're sort of starting to build up their own thing and then they do their wines themselves and they're learning as they go or or they go away and study and come back with all that knowledge and apply it here so there, there's there is a bit of both really and tell me a little bit about the winemaking process because I mean you know you see the the, the grapes 
and yes. then you see the bottle of wine. Um, but there is a whole pile of things that go on in time as well that goes in between the fact that you see those grapes in the field and then, you know, the, the wine is poured into your glass. Um, yes. Without going into, you know, huge detail, um, yes. can you tell us how that process happens? Okay. Um, so once the, once the grapes have, have been picked, obviously they have to be at the right time and there's a lot of decisions that, that happen before that. But once they've been picked, they get taken to the cellar. And in there, uh, they get pressed normally, to say it this way. They get pressed, then pass into uh, some tanks. It could be stainless steel, could be wood, could be uh, uh, concrete, could be many other ways. They get... And is this what gives flavor? So-and-so uh, is part of it, really. So if it is in wood or in the concrete, uh, it will add to it. Or if it's in stainless steel, it will be completely, uh, completely neutral. So the flavors would be the ones that great bring in rather than, uh, you know, if you put it on, on oak, for example, the oak will bring in a bit of flavor. But let's say, you know, once they're in a, a you know, pressed and in a vat or in a, uh, or in a container, in a big container, then they start fermenting, either naturally or, or induced because of the yeast that the grapes have on their skin. You know, that little cloudy uh, white bit on the skin of the grape that normally mm -hmm. Uh, is apart from other things, there is uh, yeast that starts reacting with the sugar of the grape. That's what creates the alcohol. Let's say it. yeast, it's the sugar and it produces alcohol, just to be like that. So uh, after the process, picking, pressing into a vat and fermenting, once the fermentation is done, then uh, we can go on and do uh, many other things with the wine. We can filter it and put it into a bottle, and then you got just a normal wine. You can age it in uh, oak barrels or in any other of these containers that we talked about. We, we got concrete eggs now. We got um, plastic, uh, uh, plastic containers. We got many other new ways to age wine that to add a lot, of, uh, a lot of factors to the end product. But the most classical way would be the oak barrel, you know, you put it in a fermenter, you put it in an oak barrel for X amount of time, let's say a year, two years, uh, six months, however you want to do it. And then you bottle it and you put it in the market. So, I mean, it, it, it is possible that this whole process does take, it, it's, it's not just an overnight process. I mean, yeah. this is something once you invest into a winery, you are looking long term. Yes. Uh, if you're looking at starting from scratch like you you put in the plants in and putting them in the soil and let them grow uh we're talking about between seven to ten years to maybe start seeing a profit wow yeah that is uh, long term yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh there's the, yeah there's a lot of investment if you think about uh for example here in mallorca everything and most things have to come from the mainland uh call it cardboard boxes call it bottles capsules cork uh, anything that goes into the production and all these machines are bottling machines are labeling machines are, uh, you know the pumps to pump the wine here and out. all of it comes from from abroad as well from abroad sorry from the mainland so it's um, it's obviously uh, uh, quite a big investment quite a high sort of uh, amount of money that you have to put in up front to then you know, to then trying to see a little bit of profit. And nowadays, because of there's so much uh, competition, there's so many wineries, uh, it's not so easy to put a wine into uh, into a, someone's menu or into uh, into a shop or into, uh, there's just a lot of choice, so it's tough. It is a tough job. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, obviously. No. No. <laughs> You'd have to have a fairly big bank account to set that up, especially if you're not going to be seeing profits for anywhere from seven to ten years. And I mean, obviously, the investment is huge to begin with. So, um, mm. wow, to have a, a, almost a hundred right here in Mallorca, that uh, that tells you what kind of money there is in Mallorca actually at the moment. <laughs> um, what when you guys? Um, sorry, as far as as once the wine is is produced, how do they get it? into the marketplace. Is it sold mainly in Mallorca? We, we sort of discussed a little bit of this earlier, but is it sold mainly in Mallorca or how do they export that wine and where is a lot of the Mallorquin uh, wines exported to? Okay. 
Um, normally, there's, there's a few channels of distribution or, or, or how they sell the wine. There, uh, there's the local distributors like us, for example, that, you know, we might know them, we might go to a wine fair uh, and, uh, and taste their wines and we might be interested in, or we might, you know, or they might contact us to help them with the distribution. That's, uh, that's number one, that's sort of in a local, um, in a local environment. We, we help them sort of spread the, the, the product around the island. We, we have a bit more time to go door to door to these all these restaurants and talk to the sommeliers and talk to the uh, owners and make sure that, that, you know, that they have a Mallorcan wine, that they have something, uh, something from the island that, that people might, uh, might be interested in, you know. Secondly, will be the mainland as well. The, not only we go to, from here locally, we go to wine fairs, but they also go, the wineries also go to wine fairs in the mainland Spain or in, uh, or in other countries too. And that's where their contacts get created. There's a lot of networking there and there's a lot of, um, a lot of connections that we've made once you take your wines uh, abroad, you know. And, uh, and then it's, uh, it's a bit of, uh, of a personal relationship too. It's like, or personal profession, I would say, you know, some people you get along with and some people you don't. Some wineries you click and some wineries you don't click with, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we go like that. And then... In terms of where do they get um, exported, I would say it's mainly Germany, as a big number of the, these investors are German. It's people that, you know, put their money into a winery here. And then uh, Switzerland as a, as a big consumer as well. I know, I know it's a lot of wineries sell a lot of wine to Switzerland. Uh, me being... Live it. I've lived in Switzerland for some time. I know they drink a lot of wine. They're uh, one of the biggest uh, <laughs> wine consumption nations in in Europe. Wow, I wonder why that is. I don't know. Uh, seriously, the, every uh, every day around twelve o'clock, they call it. At least in the area where I was, in the French area, they call it apéro, so the aperitif time. And everyone, sort of between eleven thirty to one, goes out and has a glass of wine and a and a little nibble and uh, and start the day like this, you know. <laughs> so there's that is it, yeah, and then there is a lot of uh, places and there's a lot of uh, culture of wine over there. Everybody yeah. drinks wine rather than beer here in Spain. Massive consumption of beer is king. Uh, so. It's quite weird because Switzerland produces very little and drinks a lot, so that's why it needs uh, wine from out, from outside their their borders. Whilst in here in Spain, we produce a lot of wine, uh, but we export most of it because within our borders, uh, people that normally drink more beer. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the type of wine that is produced in Mallorca, what is sort of the the highest number? What type of wine do they produce the most here in America? Uh-huh. I would say red. Red is uh red is king. Um but there are two distinctive uh trends I would say. There's two yeah, two trends with uh, with local grapes and then with foreign grapes. Okay. We have people that 20, 30 years ago planted or even maybe a bit more planted foreign grapes like Syrah, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and all of these uh, grapes that adapt really well everywhere in the world. And then there were people who continued the local grapes, the Manto Negro, the Prensal, the Cayet, the Girodos. Uh, so there are now two in sort of a, in a crossroad where people are starting to demand more local grapes because the uh, majority of consumers are a little bit tired of Merlot, Cabernet, Sida everywhere they go, you know, and they want to hear, they want to taste uh, something a bit more original. Uh, so we have those two things that people have a lot of really good vines that are 30 years old or, or older of Cabernet, Merlot, and Syrah, but then they're not selling their wine so much. So there's always been a bit of blending too. You put, uh, you know, a bit of Montenegro with a bit of Cabernet and it makes it a nice wine. 
but I think these two uh, these two lines are there and, and they can't be ignored really. Yeah, I think for me, my favorite is Merlot, and it is very difficult to find here. Uh, you know, a nice Merlot. Back in Canada, I used to have, you know, when I went out for steak dinner, sorry, vegans. Um, but when I went out for a nice steak dinner, uh, my favorite would be a beautiful Merlot. And, and the flavors, it, I forget the winery, and it, it kicks me now, but um, uh, the Merlot, it, it sort of, I don't know, it was really rich, and it had flavors like chocolate and vanilla, and it was almost a fruity Merlot. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and I can't find anything like that here. It's almost as if wines are completely different in different countries. And, and the same with, you know, I would drink an Australian Cabernet, um, mm. and that to me was a, a white, uh, was, was lovely. So those were my two favorite wines, but from opposite ends of the world. I didn't really fall in love with the wines when I got to Spain. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to think about um, in terms of how the plants, uh, the, the vines behave and how the, 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 the climate and, the, and the, the, you know, the soils and all of this, you have to think about if you introduce something that is foreign to here, it's never going to taste exactly the same as where it comes from. So, uh, you know, there are many factors when you're making a wine that influence the end product. And uh, one of them is the, obviously the grape variety, but also where you plant it and, and how you do it. You know? So that's why uh, Merlot from, uh, from the New World would never taste like the Merlot from France. You know? They have their similarities, they have their, their sort of common uh, aromas and things, but they're they have different hints here and there that you'll never find one and the other one. So uh, it's a big factor, really. You you have to understand that if you're uh, if you're drinking a, a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, it's going to be a completely different to Sauvignon Blanc in, uh, for example, in Rueda here in in Spain. You know, there are yes, there are varieties that are very similar, but they're gonna they're gonna behave differently. So going back to a time before you and I ever existed, or most people that will be listening to this ever existed, where does wine originate from? I think historically the first, uh, the first uh, evidence of wine recorded is from Georgia. Wow. Yes. So that's where, as far as we know, uh, where he was first uh, invented or where he first created, or for, suppose by accident, you know, put a little bunch of grapes together and uh, suddenly they start fermenting and something nice comes up, you know, like many, many things. And in this wine world was probably uh, invented or created by pure chance. So why is France sort of known as, as the home of, of great wines? I always say France are like in the Champions League. Okay, they're 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 really high up, and it's because they have the they have the good soil, they have the good uh, temperatures and and climate, and and they have the knowledge as well. They've been producing top quality wines for a very very long time. So these these three factors are very key, you know. Uh, then, but then it's a question of taste. There's some people who just don't like French wine or don't like the price tag as well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of factors. I mean, it's funny because when you travel the world and you drink wine in different areas and buy wine in different areas, you find that the taxes are really sometimes what makes a huge difference. A wine that you could buy here, for example, for five euros is a lot different than a wine that you could buy, for example, in, in Canada for $30, you know, mm -hmm. because the Canadians tax their wine so much, whereas the wine isn't so, so taxed here in Spain. Why is that? Yeah. It's uh, it's got to do with every government really. That's uh, it's very little to do with the producer, but a lot a lot to do with uh, with what uh, what the taxes on the country are really. Look at for example, recently Trump has said the uh, wine uh, and other Spanish products have a quite a high tax on, on in the United States, and uh, out of out of nowhere really, completely out of nowhere. So uh, we don't know exactly why he's done it, but he's is going to significantly uh, influence the final price of Spanish wine in the States. So uh, it could be something to be worried about. But in general, yeah, here in Spain, we have a pretty reduced uh, easy tax on alcohol. 
Well, uh, yeah, in other countries, uh, there has been a lot of problems with alcohol. They have to tax it high, so um, people don't go too crazy, I suppose. I guess what it is is that if, if people are, are becoming addicted to something, it's tax up as much as you possibly can because they'll pay it anyway. Yeah, it happens <laughs> also in the northern countries as well. The, the, their, uh, their taxes on, on alcohol are pretty high, really. So I don't know if it's to try and you know, keep the consumption down or if it's something uh, you know, to try and get more tax, tax money in. I don't know. Who knows? Well, straight across the board, taxes are rising on everything. So why shouldn't wine be included, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So um, for you folks, what is next? I mean, you, you've sort of established yourself to this point. You have changed your business model. This has been going for the last two years? Uh, no, since uh, February this year. Ah, oh, okay. Changed, so very since we changed the model, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you've sort of found your comfort zone. Where do you see yourself heading in the future? Um, I think we're probably going to be... Um, good question, really. I, what I want to focus on is trying to get people to drink something they're not uh, familiar with. Right. What, we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to achieve is that uh, people drink wines from smaller wineries, from uh, from other not so renowned places where they have a nice history, they have a nice uh, project, and they have something something a little bit more, something extra to give to the client. Because it's it's easy to go to a wine to a wine shop or a or a supermarket and pick up the brand that we know, but we try and encourage people to be a bit more adventurous and try something out of this massive variety that there is now in the market so we're, i will be happy if we can try and get you know into uh, many sort of wine menus and many people's homes with something that is from a small producer and from a small winery that, that you know they've done pretty big effort to get their product out and uh, i think they deserve to be at least given a chance yeah if if not repeated really so that's something i you know i would like what we're working for and what I would like to have, I'd like it to happen. So to focus more on boutique type wines as opposed to the mass yes. produced. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, you know, I know that you're a busy man um, and uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to let you go, but uh, we're going to provide uh, your website uh, up on this, this interview um, so that if anybody is interested in, in getting your services, you, I mean, even if it's just somebody's home and, and they want to do a wine tasting because they have guests over, uh, you guys are more than, well, you know, that you'd love to go and take your, your selection of Meyer King wines and share with, with anybody really. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so yeah, our website is uh, wineindustry.es, as simple as that. And, and yes, we're happy to, uh, to try and introduce any of these products to anybody really. So uh, we're happy to uh, take any, any calls, any emails, uh, uh, you know, get a, a little bit of advice on what to buy and what to get. We're here. We're here to help. Excellent. Well, thank you ever so much for all your time and your uh, expertise, actually, because you taught me a few things today that uh, I didn't know before. So I'm glad we chatted. For those of I'm you that are out there listening, sorry. No, I said I'm glad too. I'm, I'm happy to help. <laughs> well, that's your job is to educate, isn't it? <laughs> For those of you out there listening, we will provide uh, Evan's, Evan's uh, information up on our website uh, and, of course, all of our social media pages along with this interview. Um, and thank you so much for watching Coffee and Conversation right here on Yachting International Radio. Thank you, Ivan, for your time. This You're has welcome. been Rio. This has been Rio for Yachting International Radio.